Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be used for your glory this day and to reach the hearts and spirits of those who would hear it. Amen. Are we there yet? You don't even know what, the, what, what it is I'm asking. I could be talking about Christmas. I could be talking about our mission. I could be talking about a road trip. But that is the answer that I like to hear because the answer is I would already know all of it. We are not there yet. Christmas will soon be upon us. Christmas is a wonderful time of year where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Emmanuel, God with us, and that is wonderful good news. That God so loved the world that he wanted to be with us, that nothing would separate us from his love, not even death, on a cross. But I want to talk to you today not about Christmas wrappings, not about carols, not about the eggnog or Christmas crackers. All of these things are great at the time to share that day with our family members and our friends. But today I want to talk to you about the journey that we walk together. What our call is, what our mission is, why we're here. So I think of our Christian journey kind of like a road trip. And you always have children in the back that ask that question. Are we there yet? Five minutes later. Are we there yet? And the answer is no, we're no closer than we were five minutes ago. When you asked that. But if our Christian journey is like a road trip, where are we? Are we in a desert place? Are we in the wilderness? Or have we moved beyond that? I don't think we have. Oftentimes when I've heard sermons given about a desert place or wilderness, it's spoken of as though that's a bad thing. Who wants to be in a desert? It's dry, it's dirty, there's no water around for miles, no food, and there's no one to speak with. There is no fellowship. Who wants to be in a desert? John the Baptist in our gospel lesson came from the wilderness. Scholars think that he lived a very ascetic lifestyle as a prophet, as most prophets do, eating only the things which came from nature that was provided by God, not even things that had to be grown and cultivated or farmed. And I think when John the Baptist came out of the wilderness, do you think he was well received? Or do you think perhaps the people in his own home? His own community looked upon him as though he was an outsider, an outsider in your own home. That's an interesting image, and I think it would have been very difficult to come out of that desert place to proclaim that. I don't view a desert place or a wilderness as a bad thing. It's a time of spiritual growth, a time of development, but it's also a time of new beginnings. John the Baptist came out of the wilderness and began to proclaim that there's a coming of one greater than I, one greater than I that I am not even worthy to bend down and tie the thongs of his sandals. Are we there yet? 
where we're able to help one another in our own community. Do we lift one another up in love? that different. We have our disagreements within the church. And I would even say that those disagreements distract us from what we're supposed to be doing. To my shock, yesterday I opened up my news feed on Facebook. That's where I normally get my news. I don't watch television. And I found that the South Central jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church, which I am a candidate in, is suing Southern Methodist University, my university, over the issue of same-sex marriage. As a secular institution, Southern Methodist University has to follow national laws and state laws. And with the last general conference that we had in St. Louis in March, legislation was passed that would require universities and seminaries to screen ministry candidates. And the church, of course, believes they have the moral high ground. But the university is saying, we cannot do that, or we'll be in conflict with national law. We'll be sued by the national government for discrimination. Can you see where the tension is? And the church responds back with, as a Methodist university, an institution of higher education that comes under the church. We own your property. You agreed previously to hold our property in trust. Now, I'm not here to tell you which side is right and which side is wrong. What I want to ask you is, where is the love of the church? Where is it? Yes, we are supposed to lift one another up in love, and if we see somebody has fallen in a snare to sin, we're supposed to correct them. But we are to do so in a loving way. If we're so concerned with being right and who has the moral high ground that we harm another human being, are we doing what we're called to do? On a local church level, how well do you work together? It's a valid question. Do you work together as a cohesive unit, a team? Do you speak the love of God to the people that sit amongst you? If you don't, the people outside the church will see that. They will see that you don't work together. And if you don't treat one of your own with love, how are you going to treat someone with very love? If we're to be the body of Christ, we have to recognize that we all have individual gifts. We're unique. But that's the beauty of God's creation. Yes, God created the entire universe, but He created you, and He loves you as an individual along with the love of the body of Christ. We're not meant to all do the same thing. We each bring something unique, our own light to the table. <coughs> and we're supposed to use our gifts together.
to be stronger together in love and in faith and in hope. And if we're at odds within ourselves, a house divided, it'll fall. And as somebody who wants to be a minister in the church, seeing that kind of disagreement within a denomination or a circuit or a local church, that breaks my heart. John the Baptist said something interesting to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that came to be baptized. You brood of vipers, who told you to come and flee from the wrath to come? Why are you here? Are you here to be seen, to appear as faithful to the eyes of those around you? Or do you bring to me a contrite heart that is repentant and desires that relationship with God? Are you as a Christian people, one who looks in the mirror and then upon walking and then forgets what you've seen? When you look in the mirror in the morning, You are to see yourself as a Christian first, and everything else comes thereafter. When you look in the mirror, do you see the eyes of God reflected back at you? If not, we have work to do. So why are you here this morning? I can tell you why I'm here. I'm here not only as a minister, but I'm here as one that cares about you. I am here because I love you, and I don't want to see you. I don't want to see you or amongst yourselves a house divided, a church divided. I am here to proclaim the word of God and to help you along your faith journey. We light the candles of peace and hope this morning. Are we at peace? Do we see that hope? Where does the hope come from? Advent is about the coming of Christ, and yes, Christ brings hope. But when Jesus was lifted up on high, do you remember what he told the disciples that were standing around? Why are you still standing here? You have work to do. No one knows the day or the hour of my return, but you are to do my work. So where does the hope come from? Yes, it comes from Jesus Christ. And it's a gift that only God can offer. But the good news is, we've already been offered it. The Holy Spirit was gifted to us at Pentecost. Jesus Christ, God with us, is here in our midst. We believe that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit. The same essence of God. Where does our hope come from? Our hope comes from Jesus, but it also comes from within our own hearts. So I'm here as your minister to help you along your journey and to help you realize that the hope that you're searching for, yes, it's in Jesus, but it also comes from within you, within your own heart. The hope you seek is found within you because God has already gifted it. You have the potential to be the hope, the light in someone else's darkness. 
And that is the good news. It's a gift, freely given. And it's already been granted to you. You are the hope that you seek. For it resides within your own heart. So church, are we there yet? shall come from Jesse's tree. Everything in that passage is not past tense. It's a rod shall come from Jesse's tree. A lamb shall lay down with the lion, and they all shall be led by a child. It's not even future tense. It's a promise. And we worship a God that keeps his promises until the ends of the age. Jesus is coming. And Jesus is here. We have work to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 